Yeah, it's really uh, fantastic to be asked to, uh, to contribute um, to the, the Commission poems. Um, um, I sort of, I'm a sort of poet that unless someone tells me to write something, gives me a deadline, I don't get anything written. So um, it would be nice to get a chance to think about the city. Um, and I think a couple of the inspiration points for this poem was the fact that um, you know, cities are not, they don't seem to be built for humans, they're not built on a human scale, they're built for commerce and you can kind of like, you know, get very, very lost in these spaces. I might know all the technological advancements, I just feel that you know, maybe we're getting a little bit left behind. And also, um, I think a lot of the ills that we have in our society are down to um, the fact that we don't tell the truth about history and how things have been built or where things have come from and contributions that people have made. So those things were whirling around in my head while I was um, thinking about this. And um, that's where the science came from. I was feeling a bit nihilistic that day. Um, so it's, the city was killing us, so we tore it down. When the old city fell, we were covered in scars, but the healing had not made us stronger, it had only made us scared. We were on the edge of the dark age and the city had been a place to hide. Now that the old tech doesn't work, we're back to our most basic selves, almost animal forming connections to the landscape we try to concrete over. We are rebuilding without blueprints, using instinct to create spaces to flourish. We've learned to live without the old statues. Their plants lie empty. Public notices read, this monument has been removed until we can find a way to put it into context. <laughs> it's coincidence that the typeface is crimson though it reminds us of the times we barely escaped through streets glittered with blood. The truth gets less painful each time we hear it. We're not changing the story, only the telling. Weaving new fables to keep our children safe. We've made a home in this new city, where before there was only shelter. Found balance, if not yet peace. We're going to read um, three more poems, all of them sort of like linked to the idea of city. And um, I had a pamphlet published recently in February. My publisher would be really cross if I couldn't say the, the copies for sale um, later. Uh, only a five. Um, so, yes, the first poem I'm going to uh, read is um, was written when I was, uh, had a chance to spend some time in Iceland. And I've given it a title that I can't properly pronounce because I can't roll my eyes. Um, uh, the title is, is um, uh, it means uh, way markers, and it's about I guess moving away from the city and finding uh, finding your place within relationships. It's cool. No, oh, and there's two things um, that you need to know about that. So yes, uh, um, it refers to a um, uh, like a, a water demon called uh, Nikur which are, um, they take the form of horses, but they can just run backwards and they kind of like lure you into the water and if you go with them, they drown you. So watch out for them. And yeah, and so um, the title is called Wurdlush, which means wet markers. The wind makes the instruments of half-built tower blocks. Dissonant harmonics carve a path through my brain, destroying its way markers until I can't find my way back. The only peace is found in mountains echoing clouds. So we leave the harbour, but keep the coastline in view. If we lose sight of it, we believe the sea will vanish. The city shifts. We find ourselves at the ghost of the old shoreline, where you tell me tales of houses that wander through town, and statues that walk from overlooked corners to find a home, where the swans protect us from Nikar, but not ourselves. The wind grows fierce at Reckonus, we don't know where to begin, so we wind our way across the ash black landscape. The heather looks like embers, sand grits between our toes. We topple the way markers as we walk. We aren't interested in finding our way back. There is no po point in going back, we are not going home. You sit away from the edge of the cliff in the lee of a way marker. I stand with my back to the sea watching you, willing the wind to take the feet from under me and hurl me into the air. 
I imagine myself floating down like Jesus descending from heaven, submerging past monochromatic birds littering the swell, freeing myself of the bond that ties me to the landscape. But the wind dies down, and here I still am, still watching you sit in the lee of a way marker. Tell me stories of how the water baptised you, took away your sense of self, how it will heal you or kill you. The ocean's will to let you escape your life depends on the moods of its tides. What happens when the sea turns against you, when it tires of the burden of you on its surface? God's name won't leave your lips, sticks in your throat and drowns the good in you. We took our love at face value, failed to see the horror that was visible from behind, never knew the difference between falling and falling in love. We meet ourselves coming back from the edge of our senses, feel the emptiness more than ever. How can I be responsible for your heart when I'm no longer responsible for my own? Um, the next poem I'm going to read was written um, uh, in response to a painting by the artist Sean Scully, um, who does these sheet canvases which are essentially lots of lines of colour. Um, and I remember being in the, um, in the Land Gallery in, in Newcastle just after the news of, or um, well, not long after, you know, um, the news of, of Grenfell was sort of like, you know, just swirling around and just needing a space to escape from the, um, from the news, from everything that was happening. So this is, um, uh, the painting is called Red Light and that's the name of the poem. Red Light. When the news leaves you feeling overshadowed, leaves you living in the ruins of avoidable disasters, you find sanctuary, find salvation in the land. Inside the gallery there is never total peace. The air conditioning stage whispers white noise, the type that might soothe a fretful baby. Standing in front of red light, you want to scream. Want the red lines to absorb the pain ripping your throat, hollowing your lungs. You want to be heard. You shrink until the painting holds the menace of a tower block with all the horror that brings. The thought of being trapped, being afraid to die. To calm yourself down, you count the colours, count the lines, try to figure out which was laid down first. You want to disappear into this painting. At the lower right corner there is a luminescence. The spaces between the lines seem bigger. There's more room to think, more room to be yourself. You wait until you are completely alone, then cross the border of the painting, picking your way under each stripe of acrylic, challenging yourself to travel further in until you reach the ground, the first layer of paint with its complexity of colour, its sinuous waves. You still cannot find less. Your mind is too full of where you have been, of what you have left behind. You realise each red line links you to someone you've loved, even as these same red lines hold you hostage, keep you caged inside the painting, with no way to get back through. And um, the last poem I'm going to read is the most recent um, I wrote it uh, in January, uh, when it seemed like Theresa May was probably on our way out, and here we are in April, and she's still coming on, amazingly. Um, so I had intended to write a poem dedicated to Theresa May, but I have. Um, and this, yeah, it's about the unspeakable word, we won't mention it here. Um, <laughs> It's called Befriending the Crows for Theresa May. She wanted to understand something of herself, but she didn't have the answers, so she tried to befriend the crows. She liked the way their feathers absorbed the sun, the way they radiate energy. She was friendless and needed company, even the Corvid kind. She'd read a long time ago, they could be coaxed with gifts. She started with the mouse she found dead at the foot of the stairs, then tried fat balls made from vegetable suet and the seeds of flowers she'd meant to plant in the spring. When fortune cookies with secret messages she was sure they were smart enough to, to, to decipher failed, she tried to coax them with a replica measure from the jewel tower and an iron roof plate that fell into the Thames from the Elizabeth Tower. 
She tried a confusion of biddable politicians, miniaturised to pocket size, and a brush full of her hair woven into love tokens. She wanted to offer up the secret to life, the universe and everything, if she'd known it, but suspected the crows already did and were keeping it to themselves. She hoped the crows would be curious, but worried that they would worry about the sanity of her mind instead. Then when they came, or even if they didn't, she told them the things that were troubling her. That this journey isn't worth the shoe leather, and where she's heading feels like hell.